Good morning, everyone. It's a joy to have Amy with us today. So today we're going to talk about slip trailing. Amy's background is um, SMU graduate, and then also she went to uh, University of North Texas for her Master's of Fine Art in Ceramics. So um, she's also taught at Brookhaven College and, of course, at UNT. And she's done a lot of slip trailing and hand building classes, right? Mm -hmm. And throwing. And throwing. So she has a wonderful husband, an eight-year-old daughter now, and she loves horses, as you can see, and that's her favorite passion. Uh, yeah. So. I love your apron. Thank you. This is like this. You can see me do this sometimes <laughs> if you hang out in my studio long enough. So. Um, so I'm going to try to do a couple things. I'm going to show you how to kind of prepare slip and I'm going to use your clay body um, and make some work out of the clay that you have here in your studio so that I can leave a reference piece for you to bisque and kind of keep to look at. Um, and then I brought some pieces that are pre-made so as soon as I get that done I can move right on to slip trailing. There's not going to be a waiting period for it to dry down. Um, if I use terms you don't recognize, feel free to stop me and ask, what does that mean? Or if you have questions you want to ask about me or about the, the work that I make or your own work, all questions are welcome. I like questions. Kind of keeps the conversation going a little bit. Um, okay, so to prepare the slip, um, Pat has done a really nice thing for me in getting a thin slab made and broken up and just really dry because the slip will slake down, which is basically when it breaks down and turns into kind of that sludge a lot faster if you start with dry as opposed to clay that still has a little bit of moisture. You can also save throwing slip for this, but if you don't throw, you don't have to, right? You can just use dry clay and kind of make that. Um, so a lot of times my off cuts or my little scraps, I'll just pinch them thin and set them aside and that way they get recycled into slip when things get a little too dry. Full, so I'm gonna kind of use a little less of it in the bowl. Let's say that's a good amount to start with. Uh, and water. And you can always add more. I kind of err on the side of adding a little bit less because it's harder to take it out. So I usually fill it out just about to the surface of the dry clay. And you, could, if, you can't really hear it, but if, when you do this, you'll hear it. It'll make like a sound, and it's because that water is getting pulled into the pores in the clay really, really fast. That's one of the hallmarks of how you know it's super dry when you're starting. Okay, so while that's slaking, because it's going to take a little time, um, I'll check back with it periodically, but I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, pinching and coiling an object. So kind of like when you throw, a lot of you may do the thing where you slap it round. Well, I always do two with hand building, because if I start with something round when I'm pinching, it's more likely that the rim, when I get to the top, is going to be more level. It's never perfect. But if I started with like a rectangle, I might get really swoopy edges. And you can always trim it down, but it's just... I think it's more wasteful because by the time you finish pinching it, you have to kind of let that clay re-moisturize before you can reuse it because your hands will dry it as you're working. Okay, and then I prefer um, when I'm hand building to have a porous surface to work on so that it doesn't stick. Now some of you might find with the banding wheel surface being metal that you're happy with it sticking. That way you can kind of manipulate push and twist and that's fine and then at the end you would just maybe cut it off with wire or push your metal rib underneath it. Um, but because I want to be able to kind of pick it up and check it and sort of thin the edges, sometimes I pinch feet on it, it's more important for me to pick it up and move it around and flip it over than to keep it stuck on here. So I usually work on a masonite board um, or, or, sorry, masonite bat or a, a sheetrock board or a wood table, just something where it's gonna release. Okay, so with this one, I'm gonna kind of get it thinned out to sort of the footprint of the vase. And then using that surface underneath, I'm pushing my thumb down to just kind of start the bottom. Because I will have to do some coiling, but I'm going to start with pinching as much as I can get. And kind of build some of the base of the piece this way. So what I'm doing, because, you know, the, the neck of the animal, I'm thinking about it in cross section, it's kind of ovaled. So that's what I'm going for is a base that's kind of ovaled, like longer than it is wide and rounded on both ends. Yeah, so just kind of starting that shape. And it's always rough to begin with. You can kind of refine and smooth things out as you go. Okay, so a little bit about me. Um, Pat told you a little bit about my education background. I did start throwing clay when I was a sophomore in my uh, undergraduate studies. I 
had to take distribution, which is just basically where you take a little bit of everything just to kind of build your credibility as a studio artist. A little bit like studying medicine. You have to kind of be a generalist and then you get to choose what you want to specialize in once you know a little bit more. Um, plus it's nice to have different tools in your arsenal to work with. But I fell in love with it after one semester. I thought I was going to do drawing and painting. No. <laughs> Um, and I still like to draw and paint, but it, it's more of kind of like a, a, an aspect of my process than it is like the way I want to work, per se. I think the drawing and painting still happens a lot on the surface of the work. But yeah, I think I, think I just like 3D. And it took me kind of throwing pots to realize that I wasn't so much attracted to sculpture in a traditional sense. I didn't really want to work with marble and bronze and plaster, but I started working with clay and I loved that. You can probably all relate. I got bit, I got the bug. Okay, so as I'm kind of pinching, I'm just it's like slightly lifting the edge so I can go down here to the base and make sure it doesn't have like a skirt, kind of like how you get when you're throwing. If you don't address where it lifts off the surface, you'll get that sort of flare. So I just lifted it up slightly as I was going around to kind of control that bottom edge so that it goes 90 degrees but doesn't have a big kind of um, flare at the base. And then I'm just rotating and pinching and kind of thinning from the bottom to the top. Um, and you always want to kind of do it that way and make sure you're happy with the thickness before you can't reach it anymore. Because if I were to, let's say, just kind of keep going all the way up, then I would be trying to go back in and like scrape or try to reach from the inside and the outside with two hands. And I prefer to just kind of be done with thinning an area by the time I can't reach it anymore. So I'm going to kind of leave this bottom exactly where I want it before I graduate to the, the next tier up. Some of you may be lovers of tools. This is good. These are my favorite tools. I do a lot with these before I ever touch it with anything else. Um, so my favorite tool for smoothing, although you could use ribs, ribs are great for that too, um, is just my thumb. I kind of support it from the inside and then I just kind of scrape it either up or at a diagonal angle because I want a little bit of an imperfection on the surface, but not as much as something like this. That's too much. But you can make them aggressively textured also. You could kind of go through and just kind of let your finger marks be the texture. Right, so there's no, there's no like right answer. With, with hand building, you get to kind of let the hand mark dictate the texture if you want it to. Or you can just scrape a metal rib over everything and get it pristine. You can always kind of dart clay out, which is basically cutting out V's of clay and reattaching it if you find that your shape isn't going the right way. But right now I'm just kind of pinching it down because I want this to taper as it goes up. That's a lot easier to do while the clay is thick because it'll do stuff like this, where it kind of creases on the edge, where you fold it. The thinner it is, the worse those are, the harder they are to correct. When the clay is really thick, it's kind of easy to blend those things out. They're not going to be problematic for later. It's really important with hand building to always kind of apply counter pressure. So when you're throwing, the act of throwing, of pressing it against the wheel, of pressing your fingers together is what kind of compresses the clay so that the particles are aligned and you don't have any cracking or kind of warping. With hand building, the pinching is your compression technique. So you want to make sure you handle all the parts of the clay um, because otherwise it hasn't been compressed and it may kind of want to warp or collapse. It doesn't kind of have as much structure built into it as it does when you kind of use the wheel. So you have to let your hands and your tools do the work of compression instead. But you do want to support it on both sides, even if what you're doing is smoothing the surface. I'm not really pushing hard from the interior. I'm just making sure that as I do this kind of smoothing action, I'm not warping the wall. So I'm just supporting it. The counter pressure where I'm really squeezing it and compressing it is more from the pinching action. This part is more just surfacing. A piece of advice I heard that I thought was really good about how to get the best uh, advantage out of watching someone work, whether they're throwing, hand building, whatever, is not so much to watch what the piece is doing, but to kind of watch their hands. Because that's more instructive. That's the part you're going to have to try to do. Is figure out how to touch it and how much pressure to apply. That's always the trick. And I thought, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> it's also funny because, especially now that I started having to, with social media now, you have to film yourself and photograph yourself doing everything. And I wasn't even really that aware of how I was touching it. I was just getting the desired result, right? But then when I started seeing pictures and film, I was like, oh, there's a lot of times I don't engage my index finger because it's not the right amount of pressure. It's too much sometimes. So it's, it'll be fun for you to kind of monitor your own body movements, like how you use your hands, what feels right. And you'll see me kind of lean and stuff like that too, right? Like I have to make sure that 
I'm happy with the object, not just from here, but in profile. So it's getting thinned down reasonably well. Weight is also one of those things where it's a matter of preference. Um, you might find that you like things a little heavier than your neighbor, and I think, you know, within reason, that's more of a taste thing than it is that there's a right answer. I'm kind of like an in-between. I don't want the thing to be super fragile. Um, I feel like if they get too thin, then they're just too delicate. So with rolling coils, I have a feeling y'all might not need my help with this, but basically the idea is that as you're rolling the coil, you get to a point where you can go at more than one full rotation, um, because if you, if you do an incomplete rotation on the coil when you're rolling it, you will find that you get that flattened out coil that when you're rolling it kind of goes brr, 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 right, and it's not that like nice, consistent roll. Um, sometimes that happens more when it's wider and just persevere, push through and keep rolling it. When it gets a little bit thinner, it'll be easier for you to get those full rotations. But you can also do the thing where you twist it like a taffy and then keep rolling and that'll take that kind of like flatness and make it into a twist and it's easier to get it back on round if you, if you do that to it. Especially if you want fatter coils, you can just do that taffy twist. Oh, you can see this is starting to slate down nicely. It's got kind of that broken down texture. There, yeah, all silky. So that'll be able to be mixed up pretty soon. Okay. Um, I've got some slip going. A lot of times when clay is wet like this, I don't think, especially if you're blending your coils in, that it's necessary always to slip and score. It certainly is if you're attaching two things together that aren't quite the same moisture, like if one's drier and one's wetter, then you definitely want to slip and score and then dry it slowly so those things can equalize. But when you're coil building and it's all just wet, a lot of times I'll just do a little bit of water because I'm going to blend it right in. I just want to make sure it adheres well. And then as I'm putting this coil on, I'm pushing it from above. So you can kind of see my finger marks more on the inside, I think. I'm trying to make contact. And this is fresh and wet, so I'm just going to keep on going. Um, some people will do tons of tiers at a time. I tend to prefer to do a maximum of two. And then I'll go back and I like to use my thumb, but your index fingertip can also work. You just want a rigid, sort of firm finger surface and dry so that you can have the friction to sort of grab that clay and drag it. If you try to do this with wet clay, you'll just slip right off the surface. You won't be able to grab it properly. Um, adding water to the surface of clay, it's counterintuitive, but it actually, for hand building, kind of weakens it. So if you can do more of your molding um, dry, that's going to be better for the clay. The surface texture will be more preserved if you work with it drier. All right, so this is something I'm going to pinch and then kind of attach onto the front and kind of cut a hole where it's going to go. So with, with sculpting animals, um, it can be nice to kind of be photorealistic and try to get them to look exactly like their native counterpart, and you're welcome to do that. But I think there's something to be said for abstraction to kind of create uh, a correlation to your style, perhaps. So for me, like I'm 
wanting it to have some hallmarks of the anatomy to feel kind of believable, but a little bit kind of like a Art Deco aesthetic, I'm minimizing it so that the form language is kind of reduced into fewer sort of <coughs> planes and shape, uh, shape changes. So it reads as that animal, but it's not like photorealistic. Adaptations that have occurred as I've been building things in clay over the years, figuring out which things are needed and which things are just kind of too much information. So kind of like with throwing, you end up changing the direction of your hand and like the way you use your finger. So sometimes I have my thumb on the outside because I really want to push it in and kind of narrow it down. Um, but a lot of times when I'm kind of working the other way, I'll, I'll use my fingers wrapping around sometimes to get that curvature and kind of bend it against my thumb. So I've got this kind of gap like so. Um, I'm just kind of then changing the orientation of the hand so I can get different shapes. Um, another kind of thing I do with my hands, a lot of times once I get it thin enough, I'll kind of drag my thumb across that surface. It's both stretching and thinning it, but it's also smoothing it a little bit in the same action. And then I'm going to kind of do a little bit of the, the surface um, kind of anatomical change. So I'm going to have my finger on the inside a little behind my thumb. I'm going to start to kind of just create that edge. Soft for now. And I need to decide where the eyes are going because I definitely want to have an eye orbital. My students always laugh at me. They're like, you make it look so easy. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to, but it's inevitable. That's great. But yeah, that's, it's true. Don't be deceived. Someone walks around it and they're like, oh dear. Surprise. Okay. So when I get to the point of trying to attach the thing together, you always end up with too much. You have to kind of trim it down to fit. So I use the same method I use kind of when I'm going to attach a handle. I'll get down and look at it in profile. I'll hold the object up. It's actually going to go more up here. So I'll have to kind of close the gap a little bit. And then just kind of make a mark according to the, the leading edge of the piece I'm attaching it to. So I can sort of plot out where I'm going to cut it off. I really want it to have more of a downward angle because that's kind of how they're structured right instead of like up high. I feel like they look a little um, uncooperative when they're gazing up at the sky. <laughs> and then the, the thing you probably heard about working with wood is measure twice, cut once. I always kind of score the mark where I'm going to cut it off before I actually commit. Because um, you can always add the clay back but I find that to be annoying. So I'd rather just cut it off once and have that be where I need it. Yeah, that'll work. Okay, so I do need to kind of prune out the clay in between the kind of uh, face structure on this piece on the side. So I'm going to place this where I'm going to attach it and then trace it. It tells me both where I'm going to add slip to attach it um, and also how much clay to cut out in the middle. So I've kind of got a mark where I can see the edge, you know, of where the, the headpiece was touching it. So I can basically cut out everything that's inside. It's an and it's also important to think about the angle of your cut. Like I want this to go straight in, but you might want to do like a beveled cut where you do 45 degrees because you're going to have an overlap. Um, or thinking about whether you're nesting something inside versus sticking it against the front surface. Most of the time that's a matter of preference, but I find when it comes to the bottom, if you're ever making a bottom separately from the wall, like in slab building, you never really want to nest the bottom inside the wall. You definitely want to have the bottom like stuck on the bottom edge of the wall. Because this kind of patty that you nest inside is not really attached as well. Gravity's not holding it on, and if that piece warps at all, it'll just separate and you'll get a crack on one edge. So as much as you can let gravity help you kind of attach things together, that's going to be the best course of action. Probably with all clay, but certainly with hand building. Okay, wait, I've got some slip I can use. So it's all slaked down. There's still a little bit of texture to it, but the more I mix it, the more I emulsify it, the more those little chunks will break down. 
Um, and then like if you're making throwing slip, you want it to get that creamy, silky consistency and it's that kind of emulsification of the clay that will allow it to do that, to get smoother and smoother. And then you can also use a sieve, which we will if this doesn't extrude well. So I'm trying to get it to a trailing consistency, which is kind of like runny yogurt. It's not as thin as heavy cream. Heavy cream is a good joining slip. It's not great for trailing. Basically, the thicker the clay is when you trail it, the more it's going to retain the puffiness when you kind of put it on the surface. But if it's too thick, it can be really hard to sort of squeeze it through the tip. Um, so you're kind of looking for a happy medium. So this is getting nice and creamy. I think it's still just a little bit thick, but it's, it's getting there. And the more I mix it, the more the chunks break down, the silkier it gets. So that's why you want to use a little less than you think you need, and then you can add a little bit. Otherwise, you're going to have to let it sit and evaporate, which takes longer. So, you kind of start thinning it down, and then once you start thinning it, you can kind of throw it back at an angle. So the idea is that when it hits the table and drags because of the direction it's going, that drag is what pulls it and thins it out. It's like a pizza. get to the end of it, you know, you can use a rolling pin to kind of correct it because you'll a lot of times get thick and thinner spots, but then you're always going to want to rib this thing just to make sure that it's smooth and try to get the thickness kind of uniform. And I'm not scraping, I'm laying the rib way over and dragging it this way. So when I lay the tool over and kind of drag, it's going to thin and smooth that surface, but it's not going to scrape anything off. So that's the idea. I'm making it really thin because the thinner it is, the sooner I'll be able to work with it. Really rubber ribs are better for this, but I didn't bring one, so I'm using wood. But if you have one of those like plastic ribs or a rubber rib, that's great for this. You're mainly just trying to really compress the surface. Since with slab building, this kind of prep is the, is the compression. You don't really get compression from pinching or from throwing it on the wheel. So the action of kind of thinning the slab and then compressing it is where you get those clay particles aligned really nicely. So what I have, I have right here a little thin spot. When it's fresh and wet, you can just kind of like heal it with a little bit of wet clay. I usually grab it from the edge because that's stuff that you may not use anyway. And 
and you wanna go a couple different directions when you prep the slabs. I was uh, told five different directions. I think that could potentially be overkill, <laughs> but at least a couple, because it's kind of like gessoing a canvas. The more different directions you do it, um, the more likely you are to catch every little divot and every little air bubble and every little kind of surface imperfection. So even though like the wood rib's not the best tool for this, this thing is primed pretty well. It's pretty smoothed out, it's pretty nice. Um, and then using the sheetrock kind of as a way to support it, especially if you're making plates or like a plaster mold, it's gonna pull moisture out, it'll stiffen it a lot quicker than just what you're gonna get from air or the sun. So I'm ready to switch back over and transform this thing into a little plate. But that's it, that's throwing a slab out, just increase according to how much clay you're using. Um, another kind of like smart tidbit about slab building, particularly if you've got a really big slab and you're like, okay, now that I've got this thing, how do I like take it and then like move it over to where I'm working? Um, this is like saran wrap. It's not the same thing as the, the dry cleaning plastic that you're using, but if you adhere a piece of plastic to the slab, it makes it a lot more durable. It won't tear itself apart while you carry it. It kind of keeps it together. Um, and then you can carry it a little bit more gingerly by just using like your whole hands or drape it over a rolling pin or hold it on your palms. But basically it'll kind of hold that slab together um, while you're traveling with it. So when I make big slabs and they're wet and I have to take them to my work surface, I will just stick a piece of plastic to them and carry them over that way. Helpful trick. Also, when you're bending handles, you can wrap the plastic around them and bend them so you don't get all those surface tears on the back side. It kind of compresses that surface down. You'll have to clean up the creases you get from the plastic, but at least the clay isn't torn apart because you, you know how you stretch it and it gets those surface tears. The plastic can sort of keep that from happening. There's some of my little, I thought that's why I'd like do that. Cause like here's some hand building uh, slab oriented tidbits. That wouldn't be bad to know. Again, one of the advantages of slab building is you are not tied to having a round object. Um, and then when I'm cutting out a slab, I'm gonna try to put the knife in once, make a continuous cut as much as possible. Part of the reason I'm making these coils so short is because I have like this surface that's porous to work on. So I'm just making the coil the length of the surface that I have to work on. If you're working on a big table though, feel free to roll really long coils. And when I'm rolling long coils, I use both hands and I work from the inside out, right? So that's kind of how my technique will change when I'm making something longer. But for thin coils like this, one hand is plenty, or short, I mean dumpy. Again, I'm still kind of as if I were rolling with two hands. I'm working from side to side to get the thing uniform in thickness. I want it to match the other one because ideally, so I'm going to like make feet from these coils. I want them to be about the same diameter um, so that when I thin them, they're going to be kind of the same height. Okay, so this slab is already starting to get just a little bit stiff. It's not dead wet. I can kind of manipulate it a little bit um, and it's not showing finger marks right away. So it's at a good point for me to compress the edge. So being that it's still flat, um, I can use the surface that it's sitting on as counter pressure. And I'm using the fatty part of the pad of my finger directly against the sharp cut edge. And I'll do this on both sides. And that way I have a nice smoothed edge. It's not a sharp cut off anymore. And I recommend either your thumb or your index finger for it, but you wanna use that, that soft pad part with a dry finger again. Cause if you use a wet finger, um, it might work okay, so that way if I do it this now, right, smooth the edge now, while I have it sitting flat, then I can really press on it and thin it and kind of round it, whereas once it's up in the air, then I'll have to like gingerly support it and try to use both fingers, and sometimes you get kind of like divots and pits, so if I do it this way, I can keep that continuous pressure all the way around so that it stays nice and smooth. Okay, so once I've kind of done it on both sides, I kind of usually repeat it on the top just to make sure that any sharp edges that got lifted arc sort of smoothed back down. So I kind of got rid of the thin ends and I'll make discontinuous feet, but that way I have them kind of torn into the right length. I'm gonna soften the ends. So just by pinching them all over so that they're not torn and kind of rough. And then I'm gonna go in and make it more of a wedge shape. So it's flat on the bottom and tapering to that top edge. It's helpful when you're kind of pinching a foot um, to have it roughly in the shape you want it to be. Because if I were to thin this and then bend it, I'm gonna get all those kind of surface cracks. So if I kind of have it pre-shaped, then I can just pinch it and it's all nice and smooth all the way around. 
doesn't have all the surface tearing. The same height. Well, I don't know for absolute certain. I started with a coil. I'm sorry, who asked the question? You, okay. But by starting with a coil that's the same width, when I thin it out, as long as I use pretty consistent pressure throughout and the same technique, they'll be close enough. And then I'll show you how I'm going to make sure that foot is the right height after I get the feet attached. Because um, you do kind of have to work that out before you flip it over. Or it's, help yeah. it's helpful too. Yeah. Okay, so then I want to kind of make sure that the thing is reasonably flat. Um, so you can take a bat or um, a, a piece of sheetrock, something that's equally flat to the surface you're working on, and kind of put it on the back side, and then just tap it down. Or you can squish it really hard. That way it makes contact all the way around. So that way, now this is going to sit for a while. I'm going to move it onto this one because it'll dry it faster. The so um, I love to work low fire. Uh, I love the rich color of the clay. Um, it, it makes sense to me to work from dark to light so that way I can put lighter decorations on the surface. And I love to use a lot of scraffito so I can either carve back through the white to the red and make that dark drawing line. Um, or I can wax it and carve it and inlay the white so I have white carving lines. In this case, I kind of pre-placed the white, um, which is an ongo, what I have in this tub here, so that I could slip trail and kind of work on top of it. Um, and then I have my slip trailing bulb. There's lots of different tools you can get for this. I know you all have these bottles, right? And that works. Anything with kind of like a lure tip will work, other than the fact that the tip can't be too small. If it's too small, you'll find the slip won't travel through. It doesn't matter because the grit size is just too much for it. Um, so I actually got a, a Shiem tool, X-I-E-M, um, I don't know, maybe you might want to take a picture of this one at some point. But basically what it is, is that this particular one comes with two tips. There's a thinner tip and a thicker tip, and I always use the fatter one for slip trailing. Um, and I have 150 mesh silica sand is the grog in my clay, so it's pretty small, it's pre-sieved, so it goes through the slip trailer without me having to go back and sieve the clay. But I literally just make my slip from my clay body. It's the only way you can be absolutely sure that it'll fit is to just make the slip from the clay you're using. If you're slip trailing from a white or a black decorative slip, that's possible, but the piece would have to be really super wet because you're getting into the territory of what the Japanese call hakame, where basically you have the slip really heavy on the surface of the piece. So slip trailing is the same idea, it's really thick, so the piece has to be extremely wet for something like that to take. <laughs> um, but decorative slips, they don't kind of like shrink exactly the same as the piece you're working on. Sorry, I'm just shaking up really well. So I keep this in a plastic bag. That way it doesn't... Say that again. Which part? You said. Um, so I'll kind of talk about what I do at the end, but basically I kind of shook the slip up. I have this thing preloaded with slip. I'm going to make sure that it's in the end. So I'm using gravity. So I'm covering the tip with my finger so I don't fling slip everywhere. Yeah. And then just <laughs> engaging the slip with the tip. And if you need to kind of make sure it's extruding well, I usually will just go to my bat or my sponge and kind of just start extruding it and see if it's at the right consistency and make sure it's engaged in the tip so that I don't have air bubbles. So what's really tricky with slip trailing also is you're trying to draw while your hand is squeezed tight. Um, and if that's something you really struggle with, wetter slip is gonna extrude more easily. You can also invest in an air pen, which just kind of squeezes the, the slip out as you go. As long as you have your slip at a good consistency, it should work fine. I definitely know some people who slip trail a lot that use one and swear by it. I mean, I'm used to using a, a trailing bulb, but I think the air pen, it might be nice. It might apply like more consistent pressure. And so I just got some little spirals on the nipples. And then let's see, I have sketches for these. So I'm gonna, I prefer to hold them in my hand because I definitely want to be kind of like going like right onto that horizontal surface. It's kind of trickier when you're trying to do it this way. You want gravity to help you. So I usually pick the piece up or put it on my lap, you know, on a towel, a sponge, whatever, if you need to pat it a little bit um, so that I can let gravity help me. So you can kind of see at the bottom where it's fatter and then it tapers at the end. And it's because as I'm squeezing, I'm gradually releasing pressure so it's extruding less slips so that I can get like fat to thin. And kind of like when you're using an, an old-fashioned ink pen, the more you rest in one area, the more it'll spread out. So if you're squeezing and you kind of rest at the beginning and spread it out and make it fat, then you can kind of start dragging and release pressure, and it'll give you like the fat to thin. And that's something where, again, you can go to your sponge or your bat or your wear board and practice drawing on that until you're content with it, and then go to the piece. That way you can kind of experiment with your mark making and make sure you're happy with it.
So I've got that little swag right there. So there's some really good examples of really fat to thin. Um, and then I'm working, I'm always turning the piece so that I'm drawing this way. It's hard to do this way. You want to be dragging backwards so that as it's coming out, you're kind of leaving it behind. If you push it, you're going to remove some with the tip and you can potentially gouge the piece and push some of the leather hard clay into the tip of the extruder and, and plug it or create like a spot in your, in your trailing of slip where it's like got a chunk of clay in it that kind of has a, a divot. So you want to drag away as much as possible. Yeah, so that's kind of what I was going for, just like a symmetrical swag. Do you have any tips on <coughs> learning to get the consistent pressure with the squeezing? That kind of takes like um, practice, right? So I have it like uh, my thumb on one side and fingers on the other side, and then I just basically apply only as much pressure as I need and kind of keep my wrist stabilized so that I can try to let my hand be as smooth as possible. It's hard to slip trail with your arm up in the air, so if you can find a way to stabilize your wrist or your forearm against something, um, it'll make your mark a lot more controlled. And how do you tell when is the right consistency? You just working it and practicing with it? Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, like thin yogurt is a good kind of consistency to go for, but you can play with it a little bit. If you want a shallower slip trailing, then you can use a wetter slip. It'll be quicker to extrude, but it'll also, as it dries down, be less flatten fluffy. Out. It'll flatten out. Whereas if you want it to be really tall and really kind of sharp and, and fat, then you're going to use a drier slip, which again, is kind of trickier to use. But I think somewhere from the heavy cream to thin yogurt consistency is a good place to start. And then you can but see if you want it different. If it's too thick, will it crack off if it dries? If it's too thick, um, you'll probably want a wetter piece. Because okay. the wetter it is, the more likely it can kind of accommodate the variation in dryness. Now you said you were using Ongobe? Yes, Ongobe is different from slip in that it has a little bit more flux in it, so it can kind of stick better to the surface because I tend to slip trail on top of it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want the slip to kind of pull that area off, so it has some extra frit so, so that it kind of gets a little more melted. Stuff. Yeah. And I have, uh, I made a, a Word document with my recipe, so if anyone's fired up to try a low fire, I can definitely send it to y'all to use. Um, but the on-gobe that I use is good from about um, 06 to maybe 3. Beyond that, you just have to test it. And those numbers I'm using, you'll probably know, they're the cones, right? The, the temperature that you fire it to. So with this one, I put this kind of like white area on the back because I want to be able to treat it like stained glass and fill it with colored glaze. Um, and if I have a white base, then that glaze that I apply there will really pop. It'll have brilliant color, where if I put the colored glaze on top of the red clay, it's like old master painting. It just makes it really dull. Super opaque glazes might not matter as much, but I tend to prefer um, just to skin it with white when I'm going to use a colored glaze. So I put this white down so that I could trace the outline. This is one of the ways I treat slip trailing, kind of like enameling or, or stained glass, where I can kind of create the outline. Well, I'm sorry, my slip is cooperating really well today. It doesn't always. Um, when I get the kind of blops where it like comes out and goes and makes it like that kind of a fart splatter thing, um, I just kind of go in with a damp brush and clean that up. Like either remove it and resurface that area or scrape it off right away. If it's just on the clay, you can just scrape it off immediately. But if it's on top of like a white surface or a decorated surface, um, then you kind of want to get a tool and like scrape it off instead of necessarily brushing it in. So it just kind of depends. You can also correct the edges of your slip trailing with a damp brush if you get like a, a fat spot in the middle. So when I get to in two edges where I'm going to have them join together, I kind of overlap a little bit and then I go back and forth just like a little bit just to make sure that those two edges are kind of consistent. Um, there's not like a fat side on one side or the other. So when I got to the end and you saw me kind of do this action, that was just me joining two edges together, two ends together. Some, so some, a lot of times when I'm doing the dots, I'll kind of do a little bit of a twist and then remove it. But then when it's dry, like where I can touch it without leaving a fingerprint, then you can go back in and kind of like press those tips down lightly with a dry finger and just kind of every part that's sharp or if your extrusion has kind of the lumpy bits, you can use a damp sponge or you can use your finger to just kind of like push down the points. You can also sand the thing when it's bisque fired if you need to, right? But that's when I tend to kind of correct those points is um, after that's dried down and it's kind of leather hard where I can touch it without leaving a fingerprint. If you touch it too soon, you'll just smear it, and that's okay, just retrail that spot. So you can certainly just take like a pencil or a scribing tool and just kind of um, trace the area where you're going to kind of lay it down and then just follow along and go over the top of it. 
because even if you score the surface, if you're going to just cover it with slip, then you can just use that line to follow and it's covered. So a lot of times when I'm kind of uh, figuring out the surface, that's why I draw it first so that I can kind of see it on paper and then translate that onto the piece. But if you don't do that, you just want to work directly on the piece, then you can just do a ghost of the image and then trace over that with the slip. It gives you an opportunity to kind of decide whether or not the surface you're doing is going to work too, like if you like it or not. Maybe you might want to reposition certain elements depending on what it is. I haven't done that, but you could certainly do that. I know that's what Kristen Kiefer does a lot of. Um, she'll stamp things and then slip trail kind of around to accent the stamping or over the stamp to create more kind of in and out because the additive reductive method is a great way to build kind of dynamic surface. So that would totally work. And then you would have like thick, thin, soft, sharp, kind of different line qualities. And varying line quality is kind of what, with drawing, what I was taught is, is a great way to make it seem really interesting as well, is to kind of have more variation of line. That's part of why we love engraving so much, is because you're just using the thickness of the line to create, you know, light and dark. Because I, I was thinking about, um, I also love to do paint on canvas, acrylic paints, and sometimes I like the texture, the thick texture that acrylic paint can do, so do you think you can do that with the slip then? Yes, although a lot of times you have to kind of like tweak the recipe because um, that's basically a hakame is what that's called where you do like the really heavy like a built up acrylic fat slip. And a lot of times when people mix hakame slips, they actually will amend it with uh, a deflocculant, which is either going to be sodium silicate or Darvan are going to be kind of the two ones you get. And usually if you don't use it in about three years, it kind of turns and isn't good anymore. But if you use it all pretty quick, it's fine. Um, and typically for like a bucket of slip, you're just going to add it a couple drops at a time because a little goes a long way. <laughs> what deflocculants do is they make it so you can use less water so that the kind of particles of clay are separated really evenly in the kind of medium they're floating in. So it makes it silkier. And then also you don't have to use as much water to get the desired effect because when you're putting a fat slip on, the drier slip is going to kind of stay better than if you put just regular slip on. It's going to tend to want to crack and flake. from clogging up your tip, the slip clogging up your tip? Well, you do have to make sure that you have a wide enough tip so you can either get a tool with a wider opening to account for kind of the amount of grit you have in your clay or, and I got a sieve just in case we needed it, you can sieve the slip to kind of take out the heavier particles and also make sure it's really super homogeneous so that it travels easily and fluidly through the tip. Um, but typically when I'm going to slip trail, I will mix my slip the day before so that it has time to really get completely hydrated well before I go and try to use it. Because any little bitty chunks and kind of like um, dry spots will kind of get wet, and wet down by the next day, right? And then it'll be ready to go. I don't typically mix it the day I'm going to use it because there's always going to be some kind of chunky, funky stuff in it. Different kinds of tools to do this. There's like cake decorating tools you can get for this. I'm getting to a dry spot, so I might have to clean it out a little bit. So when I kind of hit a, part of why I like to have the fatter tip is because then I can just kind of push the needle tool through it and clear it out. And then when I feel like it's getting kind of plugged, it's usually because there's a dry spot or there's just kind of like a, a piece of grit or something. So I'll shake it up again and see if that'll fix it, which it usually does. But if it doesn't, yeah, there we go. Um, a lot of times when I slip trail, I'll go back in and carve around it to kind of build the kind of additive reductive, but you could do it the other way around for sure and either work around it um, or go right into the line, whatever kind of texture you're trying to build. So I'm just kind of adding those little floral kind of texture additions. Since this is based on a safflower, which is kind of thistly, so these are just kind of referring to like that sort of like bulb that's underneath the petals that has the kind of like uh, triangular overlays. So it's just suggesting the form of those. It's not really, oh, that's a little, that one's a little too low. It's not, um, exactly the same as the flower, but that's where they're coming from. It's that form language. I might need to refresh the slip in the bulb. Yeah, I'm probably just going to go ahead and reload it. So that's one of the ways. So if you're, if it's just not working and it just stops working, just start over, clean everything out, check your slip consistency, try, try again. Right. So just kind of getting that attached. So now you can see where this is dried down. So it kind of lost some of its volume because it's dried down on the surface and the fresh wet slip always looks a lot fluffier because it hasn't lost that water yet. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say I wanted to put down a leaf shape right. and then let it dry and then go back and add the veining. You could right. do that. It's just clay. Until it's too dry, you can just add more and more and more. Whoops. I need we somewhere to the rest of my hand. Tool. That's a good one, yeah. And the bigger tip is the one you want to use for that. Yeah. And we have the multiple tips. 
How do you pronounce that word with an Izar? I think it's Shiam, but honestly, we don't know. Nobody knows. <laughs> That's why I spell it. It's just X. <laughs> When I go to the conference, the ceramics conference in Richland, I'll have to ask them because I'll bet they'll have a table in the resource hall. Yeah, I'm assuming just based on what I know about the names of dynasties, <laughs> how you pronounce those, like the Qing dynasty and whatnot. I don't know. So it's got to be. Right. I think it's Chinese. I think. I think that's where the company is based. I can't imagine why there is a clay that would not cooperate. It's all just clay. I mean, what wouldn't work? I mean, if you have a clay body specifically designed for slip casting, that might not work because you're relying on a mold to kind of dry it into place and does it have enough structural integrity to take the trailing on the surface? I don't know, I haven't tried that, but I feel like that would probably be okay, but that's the only one where I'm not too sure if you're making you know, clay pots from slip. And I have my wrist resting against the edge of the bat so that uh -huh. I can keep my hand stable. And you're just barely um, putting pressure so that the dot will come out. Yeah, it's like I get the dot engaged, then I press it down, push a little bit so it spreads just a little, mm -hmm. and then pull it either straight back or do a little bit of a twist when I disengage so that I don't get that great big point. The wetter your slip is, the smaller your dot will be, but you'll also get um, so I basically get the clay out that I want and then dab it on. Don't forget to breathe. <laughs> it's easy to, I was just doing it, I was like, <sighs> okay. So this one's almost done. This is just the last little bit that I'm doing to this one. Okay, and that's it for that one. That's all the trailing I was gonna do. Okay, so then I'm just going to kind of push it down and lift the edge at the same time. Okay. Because what's going to happen is it'll rotate um, the foot outward a little bit as you kind of push the middle down. Honestly, it's still just a little bit too wet. I can kind of tell it's too wet because it's kind of stretching down over yep. the foot a little yep. bit. Um, but I can kind of work that in with a rib a little bit when uh, once I get it kind of shaped. So once I get the middle kind of pushed down, then I go to the rim and kind of keep curving that upwards. So I'm kind of pushing right on top of where the foot is and then lifting the edge. So I lift it up just a little bit just so that I can kind of push the foot ring out um, so that it doesn't kind of punch into the interior curvature as much. Okay. Good enough. I mean, if it were a little stiffer, which I would recommend, um, just leave it down until it's, because the edges were kind of dry enough. I think the middle's a little wet, but we're short on time, so I just wanted to get it flipped. But don't rush yourselves, right? Wait until it's ready and then flip it. The thicker it is, the kind of the slab, if it's a little bit thicker and if it's a little drier, it's less likely to pick up quite as much of the slab kind of stretching over that foot. That's why you want to let it get stiff first before you flip, because otherwise it'll kind of just wrap down over the foot ring. So you don't see the foot. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah, that's the idea. Um, and then once I kind of got this up, I went to these corners and just kind of gave them a little extra lift because I want this edge to be sort of flat in profile. Yeah, I'll try. Um, you can probably tell by this point that I'm not super scientific about this. I just get it in there and then clean it up. That's what sponges and towels are for. Okay, now let's see if this is going to work um, as is or if I have to run it through a sieve. I would like to hopefully have it just come through this tip. We'll see. It's slaked down pretty good. It's not chunky. It's nice and silky, so hopefully it'll work. Yeah, that's going to work just fine. Okay. Oh, good. Let's see, what on earth do I even want to, uh, what would you like me to draw on this cloud? <laughs> I can just kind of like uh, wing it or, free, okay, freestyle. Okay. 
Oh yeah, we wing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, nope. not like that. Sorry, this extrudes a lot more, so I'm trying to figure out. See, I didn't do my thing. I should do this, like get it figured out. Yeah, I think I can just. And you draw it toward you? Yes. Okay. Do you prefer the bulb over the bottle? I do. The bottle has a little bit more resistance. Mm -hmm. The rubber bulb, it's like you have to apply steady pressure, but it's more pliable. Mm -hmm. The bottle, it's like you can squeeze it, but especially when you start getting like where the bottle's kind of empty, it'll be tricky because you have this rigid kind of spot on the bottom and the top that's going to resist the pressure you apply to it. I feel like. But remember, we're beginners. <laughs> yeah, this could probably use some sieving or okay. just a bigger tip. Okay, well, open it up. I don't care. If I had scissors, I'd cut it off. Do you have some scissors I can we cut it off with? Yeah. We got scissors. We'll just cut it back a little bit further. Yeah, because I think what I'd like to do is cut it off right there. Just make the tip a little fatter. So now... Woo. <laughs> there is no no grog in the world can tell me what to do. <laughs> and this plate is super wet so that I can just kind of do whatever I want. But you would really like it to be a little drier, the plate, before we add the slip? Well, for as fat as the slip is, the, the wetness that it's at is probably a good thing. Okay, okay. Too much. See, we can make mistakes and it works. See? No. It's forgiving. <laughs> That's why I was hoping it wouldn't always work out, because then you can see, like, it's okay. Smear it off. Keep going. So that's what I was talking about. You can just adjust the, the tip of your tool accordingly. And then let's say you get something like that and you're like, well, I don't really want to completely remove it. Um, you don't have to. Just go in with a damp brush, go against the clay, and you can just kind of pull some of that slip off and kind of correct it. You can also go back when it's dry and carve it mm -hmm. to kind of refine the edge mm -hmm. or carve into it. All that works. Okay, so get it engaged. There we go. Yeah, that's why you got to make sure you just put your finger over the tip and then do it. Just like that. Because believe me, I have done it in my studio. I'm like, huh, whoops. So I'm just kind of treating this as a thing going along the margin. <laughs> so if I had time and I just did whatever I wanted, right, I could potentially run the slip through a sieve and then I could have kept that narrow tip, like if that small line's really important to you. But that's why I said thing two is you just decide you don't want to do that, you just want to be able to trail it, so then you just make a bigger hole some kind of way. Get a tool or modify a tool. Okay. I'm going to try something that I think might be fun. So I'm going to get my brush kind of on the wet side, a little damp. You could, do, you could do flower petals with a technique like this, right? Mm -hmm. But this way it has like an edge on one side and it's kind of feathered in. And this is a good reason to have kind of like the fatter slip because then you have some you can pull away.
And I'm just kind of keeping my bristles nice and flat. And then when this dries down, because this is a nice wet piece, there will still be a little bit of residual texture. Mm -hmm. that, like if you're using a transparent glaze or a stain, for example, you can kind of emphasize, pick that texture up a little bit more. I think you could. I tend to use my thumb more when I'm using like just regular working clay to kind of smear it to get that nice kind of like linear texture. For this, I feel like the brush, a soft kind of bristled brush works good because otherwise you can kind of destroy this texture of the slit that's so delicate. <coughs> um, so you, for me, this part, I think using a brush for the way I want the texture to look is preferable. You mentioned earlier that the, uh, the same slit that you're using on your clay body would be best, but could you use your red slit on this? I wouldn't because they don't shrink the same amount. So if I put the red clay on this, it's probably going to pop off at some point because um, it shrinks more, so it'll kind of pull off the surface or crack and separate from itself. So there's no way you can make that work? You could, like let's say you, if you want it red, you could take your slip and add a bunch of red iron oxide to it or a red mason stain to amend the color, and it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't change the shrinkage kind of nature of the clay. They would still fit. So that would be, I think, a better candidate for you to kind of like um, pigment your slip than to use a different clay body. If you're going to design a slip for trailing that's a different clay body or is just like a, a formula for slip, you would have to probably do some pretty good testing, make sure it stays fitting. So it would be like make a test tile, take the slip, trail it, fire the thing, glaze the thing, and then get it back and decide whether or not it's working for you. Because if it's not working, that sometimes the surface tension of the glaze will pick it off when you glaze fire it because it just kind of pulls too much as it kind of cools and shrinks. Um, that's usually I find when slip trailing is going to fail, is glaze will kind of pull it off because of the surface tension. So that's kind of what I was thinking I'd do for the plate, something simple. Because you do want this inner surface to be nice and smooth for people to eat off of. So that's why I was thinking I would kind of take down the slip texture towards the center so there's like a, a decorative edge. Um, and once this is dry, I might go back and kind of like carve the, the lobes to make them a little bit rounder where you can always go back and add a little bit more. And I didn't really disrupt this edge, but I could have certainly like pushed the brush to make that leading edge a little bit more undulating. Um, I'm trying to kind of dictate a certain edge for it, but if you're going to do like a flower, for example, you could just push it. Okay. See, it comes full circle. Now, let me go back to my drawing. What was I going to do with these main hairs? There we go. So I might plot these out just a little bit because I, kind of I kind of want them to braid together up the back. So I'm going to kind of just eyeball that just a little bit, just so I, like we talked about, so I have ghost images, ghost lines to follow, so I can just trail over those as the kind of like uh, format that I'm working over. Yeah, and then it'll just go straight in the front. Okay. So basically just using the damp brush to kind of, because the fatter lines, I think it's easier to get them a little inconsistent. Um, so then again, just kind of going back in with your damp paint brush, you can kind of correct it a little bit, kind of get those lines prettier. Where, there's like something I can see from there, but not from here. Where are you? There you are. Yeah, and just kind of correct that shape a little bit. Because once it dries down, unless it's a pretty raised texture, you really kind of can't see it that well. Some people might be really fast at this, I'm not. Um, 
yeah, I think this is kind of a tedious process. It's, it gives a really nice result, but a steady hand and some patience and being willing to correct things that don't quite work out are all part of the process, and This I think. I also use a lot of sprig molds. Um, I know there was some talk of stamps. Are you, are you all, do you all know what a sprig mold is? Okay, so the sprig mold is kind of the inverse of the stamp. A sprig mold is when you take typically like a bisque slab, that's whatever thickness you need for whatever depth you're going to carve it, and then you carve the negative into that so that you can kind of like bisque fire it and then press clay in, scrape the back flat with your metal rib, and then pick it out with your needle tool or your kind of um, scoring kind of wire brush, and then slip and score that down on the surface. So you have a low relief sort of object that you can repeat. Or you can make multiple ones that kind of fit together. Or let's say you want to do like a vine with leaves, you could do the sprig molds of the leaves and then just slip trail the vine stems. So that way you can kind of like bridge the gap between these low relief surfaces without having to carve or sculpt each one. That kind of sprig mold is a quick way to reproduce something that's the same every time. So sometimes I use sprig molds too as part of this. So you can kind of see the idea of what I'm going for. I had to figure out how to overlay it on the back, and I didn't just want them going up randomly so it's kind of like an offset, like a basket weave. So before I kind of slip trail too much around this opening, I'm just going to take my damp sponge and kind of clean it up a little bit. So it's just a little prettier and smoother. <laughs> I'm starting to figure out this tool just a little bit. That's part of it too, like you're using something new and you're like, well that's not right. Just keep doing, just keep going, it'll, it'll come around. If we use that bottle, should it stay three quarters full at all times, say? Um, mm, so yeah. that we can get the consistency coming out of it? I think at least halfway, just because you don't really want to, if it's too empty, it'll be really easy and fast to get the air pockets yes. that kind of make it blop. Okay. Um, so yeah but mainly it's just keeping engaged with the tip however much you have in there. Okay. So that's kind of what I was thinking for the main, although let's see. This gap needs some. So if you are going to slip trail sideways like I'm doing, stop every once in a while before it does the bloppy thing on you and just re-engage it with the tip because gravity's not helping you as much this way. So that way I've kind of established a plane that I can build upon with the surface. <coughs> Done. Really yeah. enhances it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because this is, I tried to kind of show it both ways. I both draw on top of pieces, and then I also use it to kind of accent or continue formal language. So those are kind of two good ways to use it. Um, it's a great way to kind of build that additive reductive surface, too. If you're going to carve in and slip trail on, then you've got the push and the pull, and that always makes surfaces a little bit more dynamic. 
So what you're going to have to figure out as you go is kind of what to do with your starts and stops. So like we talked about, anytime I stop and start, I kind of go to that point, extrude, and then back up and kind of like blur it out a little bit. Because otherwise you will get really obvious, like there's a little bit of one right here. But those things are pretty common, so you can just kind of clean it up just a little bit when they happen. But I find that kind of like working the tool back and forth across that connection point tends to kind of blur it together a little bit better. And then once I get the trailing on, this thing, uh, might, I might do a little bit of carving in the main, but it's pretty much done at that point. I probably, if I were going to glaze this, would use some different glaze colors. Mm -hmm. um, like I might do the bridal one color of glaze and kind of fill those piped lines with one. And then if it was going to be a horse that had a variable color like a bay, then I might do like black glaze in the main and like a red or brown glaze on the rest. Probably take something a little bit darker to the eyes. Um, but if you do it all one color, then like, so imagine this thing all one color of glaze, it'll just be kind of more of like a, a chess piece or like a sculptural object. It won't be as alive. Right. So it just kind of depends on what you're after from the piece on whether or not you want the thing to seem alive or not. On how naturalistically you glaze the thing. But for me, I like a little bit of the naturalism, but that's definitely not necessary. There's an advantage to letting the thing be all one color. Well, it's that too. <laughs> that certainly is one kind of advantage. So I'm going to do the, the head part, the kind of uh, nose band and cheek strap, and that'll be it. Yeah, exactly. Just, just like I did for the main, you just plot it out. And then if you cover it with the slip trailing, then it's like it never was. But you know it was there, and that's what's... Another thing that might happen is as, uh, that happens as you're trailing, if you extrude it and it seems a little bit fat, release your pressure and drag that line out and kind of will stretch that fat spot out. Um, so, you, so like right here, it kind of got a little heavy for a second and I just stopped and kind of dragged it a little ways right here in the middle of the noseband and that kind of pulled it out so it didn't get fat in one spot together. <coughs> Yeah, so I thought if I could do it with your clay, then it would show you that it's possible. So you wouldn't feel concerned about trying to figure it out. So like what I did, I just cut the tip off my tool, you know, make it happen. That you prepared today. Ah, oh, no, that's kind of trickier to work out. Um, sometimes when I use mason stains, I just kind of like add some and then use it, and then it is what it is. But if you're looking for a real specific color, you might want to mix up smaller batches, put like a teaspoon of stain in each one, test it, and then if it needs more color intensity, add a little bit more. And keep good notes. If you're like, okay, I have a cup of this slip and I added a teaspoon of the stain, okay, and then you add a little bit more and then kind of you can remix it so you can get exact colors. That's another way you can approach it. Yeah, I mean, mason stains, unlike oxides and carbonates, the mason stain looks more like the fired color it's going to become. So if you're using purple, it looks purple. If you're using blue, it looks blue. Um, it functions a little bit more like a paint than some of the kind of ceramic materials will. But they do tend to get more intense in color when they're fired. So they're kind of powdery to begin with, and then you fire, and it's stronger. Um, and some of them are more intense than others, like blues are always really powerful, whereas pinks and yellows, are, you're not going to get as much ground covered. Y'all are firing cone six. Five and six. You usually still have really good color intensity at that. It's when you start getting to cone 10 when you start to lose some of the soft colors. But at mid-range, you should be fine for any kind of pigment you're using. But pinks and yellows are usually the first to go as far as what you lose when you go to high temperature. Like a lot of times, I actually just use the mason stains to create gradients. So I'll just kind of start with a little bit and then just add more. And I haven't really kind of like, because um, I'll just do that on a, a series of work and then, I don't know, they might be a shade off on the next batch, but it's still a gradient, so gradient, whatever, you know. So you can also kind of do it that way where you add a little bit more as you go, like do a wash in one and then add a more and then back up and do a little more and kind of build that tone. Um, so it's not just kind of like sharp edges. So I think I might do a little like texturing in the main, but that's, that's the idea. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, so I think I'm going to call that done. That's that. Very nice. Very nice. Okay, thank you.